Hello everyone and welcome to this new episode of Talks. Today we have with us Louise Ferbach and she's going to talk about deep learning for survival analysis. So Louise, sorry if I'm not pronouncing your name right, uh, but yeah. And uh, she's working with SCORE where uh, she's working as an actuarial data scientist. So what does an actuarial data scientist do, Louise? So actually, an actuary is a statistician that is specialist of the insurance sector. So score is more like in the reinsurance uh, sector. So it's like basically it's like insurance for insurance uh, and uh, data scientist. I think everybody on this channel knows what it is. <laughs> <laughs> and um, what, what is reinsurance? So what, what does score do? OK, so um, it's so basically it's insurance for insurance. So the idea is that like when you have a problem and it's too big for you, the insurance pays for you. It's a security net. And that's basically the same thing when the insurance has a catastrophe that is so huge that it's even too huge for the insurance company, then it goes to the reinsurance. For example, okay. we have seen like storms, floods, everything uh, of that kind. So even the natural disasters are covered. Yeah, okay. particularly the natural disasters. Sounds, sounds very interesting. So in, in your day-to-day -day job, you use survival analysis a lot. Yeah, I'm in the life department. So we're working on, well, life. And so it's a lot of survival analysis, trying to predict uh, global trends in mortality rates uh, and among the insureds. Cool. So, so excited about today, uh, learning about deep learning for survival analysis. So without further ado, the screen is all yours, Louis. Okay, so uh, hello everyone. I'm very happy to be here today uh, to talk to you about deep learning for survival uh, analysis. So my name is uh, Louis Farbach. I'm a Kaggle Competitions Master. So I'm also Data Science Ambassador for the HP. And uh, as Abhishek just said, I'm actually a core data scientist at SCORE. So uh, I will first try with a brief overview of uh, trying to help you grasp what exactly is survival analysis. Uh, then I will go into a bit more detail about the statistical framework uh, surrounding survival analysis, but not too much math so that uh, those of you that are not familiar with the topic are not lost. And then I will go into uh, the deeper subject, which is uh, I will present two major uh, deep learning models uh, for survival modeling, which are uh, DeepServe and CoxTime, but know that there are a lot, lot, lot more uh, of them. So I'm just presenting two, two um, main models. Okay, so first, uh, what is survival analysis? So uh, in the broad sense, survival analysis is the dur duration before occurrence of an event. But it's not necessarily about uh, measuring uh, lifetime, uh, time before death. It can be applied actually to a lot of different uh, fields, uh, as I will show at the next slide. So uh, this event, it can be either certain, like this, because, well, everybody is going to die one day, or uncertain, for example, when you're uh, trying to predict credit default, where it's not sure that the person will default, maybe uh, he or she will not. And also this event is either observed or not observed. Uh, this is what we call censoring. For example, when we have someone which is doing um, medical uh, study, which is part of a medical study, and he leaves the country, go live, he goes live some, somewhere else. So we don't have follow-up for this person. We don't know whether he is alive or dead. Also the main issue in survival analysis uh, is that it's especially hard to collect duration data. By definition, uh, duration data is something that takes a lot of time to collect. Uh, it's not something that is instantaneous, like measuring somebody's weight or measuring uh, the atmospheric pressure or anything of that kind. So when you have uh, statistical studies that span over decades sometime, uh, it can be very difficult to have uh, large data sets. So survival analysis uh, can be found in various fields. 
So it can be found in credit risk in the banking uh, area. For example, uh, in this frame, death is a credit default and the lifetime of a person is just the time it will take for him uh, before he defaults. Well, it's possibly infinite. Uh, it's also very popular um, in engineering uh, for studying uh, mechanical failure of machines. For example, you want to predict uh, when a toaster is going to uh, be broken so that you can sell uh, in your advertisement that it, it is guaranteed for two years. So you need estimations of the lifetime of your toasters. It's also very useful in public uh, policies. For example, if a politician wants to get an estimation of uh, the impact of new unemployment benefits, like uh, he wants to have an idea of uh, how much time a, per a given person is going to stay, is going to either stay in job and then the death even is uh, losing your job or staying uh, unemployed and then the death even is uh, finding a new job. Um, it's also useful for churn rate for people who are uh, working in e-commerce and who want to estimate uh, like customer retentions. Uh, so here's a death event is just uh, a customer who deletes his account. Um, it can be used in well everything that is insurance related. So critical illness dependence. You are trying either to estimate the time before a person becomes uh, develops a critical illness or becomes dependent or uh, the opposite once a person has become critically ill or has become dependent how much time it's going to take for this person uh, before he or she leaves that state so most of the time it means really dying uh, it's also uh, it can also be used in divorce like when you're trying to predict the lifespan of a marriage and then your death event is having a divorce. So it's, uh, as I said precedently, it's um, an example where the event is not certain. It's not sure that uh, all, all um, couples are going to divorce. So um, now I will move on to um, setting up uh, survival analysis uh, general frameworks with the general mathematical tools that uh, are necessary. So I'm trying to stay high level. For more details on this, you can have a lot of resources that are available online. Um, it's a very, very, very widely studied field of statistics. So uh, what we're going to do is we're going to study an individual I and we're going to call his lifetime T. So it's a random variable that you're trying to estimate. So here uh, I'm talking about individual and lifetime because it's more intuitive to grasp, but as I said recently, it can be anything. Like it can be your individual I can be a toaster and T is uh, his lifetime, it's lifetime. So before it, it fails, it's broken. It can also be just a person and T is a time before uh, it has a credit default or anything. So it's a random variable. So it's uniquely defined by its cumulative distribution function, which is great F. And uh, don't mess things up here. It's important to get that T is a duration. It's not a date. So it's an age. For example, it can be 50 years if a person dies at 50 years of age. It's not, it's not a, a date. So it's, it's a duration. So uh, the, main, uh, the main mathematical tool that you're studying in survival analysis is a uh, big surprise, the survival function. So the survival function, it's just a probability that, indivi uh, that uh, for a given age t, that an individual will still be alive at that age. For example, uh, you take 50 and I want to know what is the probability that this person will still be alive after 50 years old. So it's just a one minus the community distribution function. But most of the time, um, this function is not really that interesting. For example, if you are um, if you are a buyer and you want to buy a secondhand toaster, so it has still uh, it has already been used for some time. So it has already uh, reached a given age x. Let's say one year. Let's say it's one year old. So what 
is really interesting for you is not really its survival function, but its survival function given the fact that it has already reached the age of one, uh, so the remaining uh, survival time. Uh, it's particularly useful in, for example, life insurance when you have, because when an insured buys a contract, he has already a given age. For example, he's already 50 years old. So you know he's already he has already reached the age of 50 years old. And it, it does change a lot of things because uh, in the mortality rates, for example, you have some uh, comparatively high mortality rate at 20 years old because people are partying a lot, driving under alcohol and having accidents, for example. So you know that this person has not been a victim of a car accident at 20. So it, it's an information that you're going to want to use to estimate a uh, survival function. So the conditional survival function is just uh, the probability that it will reach a given age, uh, knowing that it has already reached uh, an age X. So it's just, uh, it's just basically uh, the division of uh, both survival uh, functions. So a quantity that is of interest here also, it's uh, what we call the hazard rate. So uh, to get things more intuitively, the hazard rate is like the immediate danger you are in, like the, image, the immediate probability you have of dying right now. So it's a probability that t, big T equals small t, given that you have already reached the age t. For example, I'm 23, so my hazard rate is a probability for me to die exactly now at 23 years old, knowing that I have reached that age of 23. And we just have the convention of zero uh, divided by zero equals zero. It's just for some coherence when you have uh, some age that are out of possible values. For example, if you take 200 years old, well, the probability to be today at 200 years old is zero because it never happens. And it's also zero for the probability of dying older than 200 years. Year, years old. So in the continuous case, it's basically um, basically the same formula. Instead of having discrete probabilities, you have just a limit uh, of your time duration uh, when it tends to uh, the present. But basically, it's uh, it's the same idea behind, and you have the distribution function, and it is equal to the distribution function divided by the survival function. It's the same that you. Uh, could have seen uh, in the above equation. It was the instantaneous probability divided by survival function. So uh, what is the relation between the hazard rate and the survival function? So I have written both equations in the discrete case and the continuous case, but actually the discrete case is very, very intuitive to grasp. So you can see that um, the probability that I will reach the age of let's say 50, it's uh, the probability that I don't die at two years old, knowing that I didn't die at one, multiplied by the probability that I didn't die at three, year old, three years old, knowing that I didn't die at two, etc., etc. And then finally, you have probability that um, the person didn't die at 50, knowing that uh, he didn't die at 49. So that's why you have a product for all the ages uh, before uh, the uh, target age of one minus the hazard rate, which is like the idea of a security rate. Okay, so now I will get to a very, very important topic uh, in survival analysis, which is very pregnant in the data and is essential to grasp, which is the idea of uh, censoring and truncation. So basically, um, Censoring and truncation, um, they are linked to the fact that your data in survival analysis is very rarely complete. As, as I said earlier, it's very hard to get uh, survival data, duration data, because it takes time. And you can have a lot of events that occur on the people you study um, uh, during that time. For example, if you take, I don't know, a study about cancer patients. Like you want to study 
uh, the survival rates among uh, a group of cancer patients. So you have to follow them for years and years. Maybe sometimes it's even decades, decades for cancers that have uh, good survival rates. So during that time, a lot of things can happen. For example, a person uh, can leave the country, uh, go live somewhere else, and you have no follow up for this person. You don't know whether she's alive or not. Uh, a person can also die of something else that is not related to what you're studying. For example, if you're studying cancer patients and one of your uh, patients dies of a car accident, uh, if you have huge data groups uh, among maybe 100,000 patients, it's very likely that one person among these 100,000 is going to die of a car accident during the 20 years of your study. So this person, even though even though this person is dead, uh, she didn't die of the cancer. She didn't die of the uh, actual topic of interest for you. So you consider her censored. So here uh, on this illustration, censoring is illustrated by the red points. You have people who leave the data set. And truncation is a phenomenon that is not linked to uh, the actual individuals. It is linked to the data collection method. Uh, if you, it's mainly if you have bounds on your data collection methods. For example, uh, your, your, you start to study cancer patients in 2010, and you don't know before 2010 uh, for how long they have had cancer. Um, an example that is more uh, comprehensible is, for example, if you study, uh, if you study revenue data that is provided by the tax department of uh, of a government. Uh, you have censoring. Why? Because you only have data on people who pay tax, uh, who, who pay uh, revenue taxes. So you have uh, truncated all the people who were below the threshold for uh, this, for, below the, the tax threshold. So you're losing a lot of people because of this truncation. So uh, to sum things up, Censoring is when an observation is incomplete, but it is due to some random cause that is linked to the individual. And truncation, it, it is when the data is, is, is uh, incomplete, but that's because of uh, the data collection method. Uh, so a big question here is, uh, can we throw away uh, censored information? Uh, because you, you, you could say like, well, it's complicated. Uh, this person left the study. I don't know whether she's alive or not anymore. So I'm just gonna throw her away. Well, that's a very, very bad idea. Uh, the main reason why, well, there are several reasons why it's a bad idea. The first one is that um, even if it's incomplete, it's still data and you never throw away data. You have to find a way to use it because it's still information. Like you know that this person lived up to a given age. You don't know after, but you know that she lived up to a given age. She could have died earlier and she didn't. So that's still information. Uh, another reason is that it's gonna make all the models you build very, very biased towards uh, lower values. Because of course, uh, somebody that lives longer has a much higher probability to get cancer at some time. If you have cancer and you survive your cancer for 30 years, there is a much higher probability that you will die of a car accident in the meantime than if you survive your cancer only one year. So, it, so um, throwing away right sensor information would induce a big bias towards uh, towards short lifetimes. So another bad idea is to say like, I'm going to treat censoring as death, like this person left the study at some point, and I'm just going to say she died at that point. So that's also a bad idea. Uh, as previously, because uh, she didn't die at that point, she lived longer. So you're going to induce a bias in your model towards uh, lower lifetimes. So um, to put it in a mathematical frame, uh, your data is going to be uh, some information about people while you have um, two main uh, values of interest, y and delta. Uh, y is just the minimum of the lifetime in the censoring because it's the only thing you know. You know, like at some point, a person either dies or leave, but you only know the minimum of them. You don't know what happens after. And you know if this person has died 
or if it's a uh, censored information. So that's all you know. You know when she left and you know why she left, if it was death or censoring. So now I'm going to introduce uh, the main model that I will study uh, here. It is, a, it is a model that is very, very central in uh, survival analysis. It is called uh, the Cox regression model. So uh, a very important uh, thing that I have added here compared to the uh, precedent equation, it was here I had only information on the uh, duration and the cause of depart. Here I have an additional information, which is a vector z. So this, this vector z is what we call covariates. Uh, for example, in insurance, it can be uh, medically relevant variables. For example, you can have uh, the BMI of a person, like uh, how much, uh, wh what is he, his or her BMI at some point. You can have blood pressure. Uh, you can have uh, any 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 other medically re relevant data. Uh, it's true for all, um, all all topics. For example, in in credit risk, uh, in your uh, covariate vector, you can have uh, you can have values that are, for example, the revenue of the person, and you could have multiple values that show the evolution of the revenue of the person. You could have, uh, for example, marital status, number of children. All these parameters are going to have a huge influence on um, on the probability that the person defaults. Because if uh, she's a high earning person with no children, uh, she's prob she has probably less chances uh, of defaulting than uh, if she is a single mother with four kids and is uh, switching between temporary jobs. So these are so Z is just a factor of everything that is of interest for your model. So uh, the Cox proportional hazards model is uh, stated here. So uh, basically, it's a model where you have uh, the hazard rate. I don't know if you remember earlier, mu was the hazard rate. So it was the instantaneous probability uh, of dying. So your hazard rate is uh, known given uh, given this information that you have. So I have a T conditioned uh, on Z. So it's important because, uh, like I explained, uh, co this coverage can be very, very, very pertinent uh, in studying uh, the lifetime of uh, your individual. And uh, in the proportional hazards model, what are you doing? You're just saying that your hazard rate, which has no uh, form a priori, you have no idea what it's like. A priori, your function, which is here, it's just uh, your density divided by the survival probability, but it could have any shape. You have no information at all on what it's going to look like. Uh, but here you make an assumption, and this assumption is that uh, you can separate it in uh, two parts that are multiplied. The first one is what we call a non-parametric baseline hazard, and the other one is a relative risk function. So what does it mean? Uh, the word proportional in proportional hazards, it's linked to the fact that the two uh, parts uh, of the function are multiplied. So uh, if you fix one, for example, if you fix the HT, and you make your covariates z vary, for example, uh, the BMI. So you take a lot of people who have the same HT and you make you, you, you and they have different uh, BMIs z. Uh, the uh, conditional, uh, the conditional hazard rate is going to vary as well. Probably somebody who has a very, very, very high BMI or a very, very low BMI uh, is going to have a much higher hazard rate because probably he or she is not in a very good health than somebody that has a BMI that is in the uh, normal range, medically speaking. So um, the first part of this equation, so it's a non-parametric baseline hazard. And the idea is that for p identical people, for identical people who all have the same covariates, uh, the hazard rate only depends on, uh, the, uh, on the threshold you put on T. And inversely, for people who all have the same age, the hazard rate is depending only on the coverage. So that's a big assumption here, actually. 
uh, it's not always something that you verify in the data. Uh, for example, you can have, uh, for example, for a lot of people, BMI and BMI and age are correlated, etc. And you have a special case of this function. So, so here, the the so, so excuse me, the relative risk function. It has the form of an exponential of a function g that you know nothing about. But uh, basically, later, uh, this function g is going to be our neural network. And uh, it's a, so it's a function of the input, the cover it. And in the linear case, which is spatial case, where your function g is just a linear function, it's just the dot product of your vector z of cover it times a set of parameters theta 0. So there's no, you can see that there's no bias here. There's no constant. That's just because since you're in an exponential, uh, the constant would just get out and just multiply the uh, non parametric baseline hazard. So it, it's not relevant to put a bias in the, in the um, J function since you can put it in the, since you can just multiply this non parametric baseline hazard. So in the linear case still, you can see that you will have uh, your function G, which is uh, like a theta 1, Z1, theta 2 plus, sorry, plus theta 2, Z2, for example, you can have a parameter theta 1 times BMI plus parameter theta 2 times, I don't know, blood pressure. And since you are in an exponential, everything here is going to get multiplied. So actually, the, you, you're, you're going to be able to separate the effect of the BMI, BMI and of the blood pressure, and they're going, going to be uh, proportional. So it's, 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 a very, very, uh, it's, very, it's a very powerful assumption. So um, what do you optimize when you're trying to, uh, when you're trying to solve this model? Uh, the parametric part, uh, which is the exponential part, uh, it is fitted by maximizing what we call the cost partial likelihood. So basically, that's going to be the loss of your model. The loss of your model uh, that you're trying to minimize is going to be the cost partial likelihood. And it doesn't depend on the baseline hazard. The baseline hazard is just the part that is only related to age. Uh, so uh, the parametric part is the part that represents the impact of uh, the coverage. And uh, then when you have done this, in this done parametric hazard, it is estimated based, based just on the previous results. So the cost partial likelihood, I have put it here. Uh, it's going to be the loss of our model. So it's very important to get uh, a general idea of how it works. So you have a product for all your individuals which are uncensored. This is the meaning of the products on all i's for delta i uh, equal one. Uh, if you remember delta y, it was, uh, it was uh, an indicator that would say that your person is dead. It is not censored. So you have you have a complete observation, and for all these individuals, uh, you multiply a product of, uh, um, uh, sorry, a division of uh, the the uh, likelihood of your data for i and the sum of all likelihoods for all the individuals that are still alive when you stop observing i. So I'm gonna explain this a bit slower. Uh, so you. You, you proceed to, get, to calculate the cost partial likelihood, you proceed in two steps. First, you take all your individuals which are not censored, for which you have complete observations. Uh, and then for this, for all this, you uh, divide the, uh, just the relative risk function, the uh, individual risk function, you divide it by the sum for all individuals. And here, be careful, it's really all individuals. So we're taking into account censored here. It's really all. The sum on J doesn't have any censorship criteria. That's very important. So for all these individuals um, that are alive when I dies. So uh, what it means is that you take into account the censored information. As I said earlier, you can't just throw away censored information. You can't just say, well, all censored are dead. It's, it's going to induce a bias in your model. And here, what you're doing is that you're taking them into account in the sum in the denominator. Uh, for uh, the, you're, you're taking into account the relative risk functions. So um, 
your, so this is the, the loss that we're going to minimize. So it's going to be the log loss and it's going to be variance of it. But generally speaking, it's always the same ID of uh, this partial likelihood that you optimize. So it's very important to, to really understand that uh, you have the uh, uncensored informations that are uh, indirectly taken into account by uh, the sums by the, the, the denominator of each term. So I, yeah, yeah and I've, I just forgot uh, to explain like the like what what is the likelihood? Uh, generally speaking, the likelihood is the probability uh, of having the data that you have uh, knowing uh, the set of parameters that you're relying on. So it's just like a probability of having your data, given a set of parameters and you want it to be as high as possible. So now I will um, dive into two main uh, deep learning models for survival uh, analysis. So as I said, there are a lot more of them. Uh, as the two that I'm gonna present are DeepServe. Cox times are based on the Cox regression models. Uh, there are a lot, lot, lot more models. I invite you to do uh, some research to take a look at uh, what they are, because it's it's really interesting uh, to get an idea of all the different uh, things that you can that you can do on survival analysis. So the first one is DeepServe. So uh, it's based on the Cox proportional hazards model that we saw earlier. Uh, it has a slightly different log function, loss function. Sorry. So it's a log likelihood here. It's just a log likelihood. So. Uh, it's, it's, it's slightly different, but it's based on the same structure of the uh, Cox likelihood that we saw precedently. And here your G hat theta is, it is your neural net. So your G hat is your neural net. Theta are the weights of your neural net that you are trying to optimize. And uh, so, so yeah, yeah you, you can maybe recognize that it's a log of the same structures we saw precedently, and they added a uh, penalization term, weight decay, which is the lambda times the um, times the L2 norm squared of the parameters. This is just a regulariz regularization term. It's not. Uh, it's not. Uh, it, it doesn't change uh, a lot in, in the loss function. So you have your, your so you have your model estimated for uh, the data. Uh, for the ancestral data, the CIs, and you have a minus because of the divide earlier, and uh, log of the sum of your model estimated for all the individuals that are still alive when uh, your individual i dies. It's uh, it's this uh, yj uh, bigger than yi. So uh, another model, Cox time. It's based on a different assumption. So, as I saw precedently, the Cox proportional hazard assumption is a very, very huge assumption. It's not always verified in reality, and um, much more general frame could be to say that my hazard rate, conditional to the uh, covariance that I have, the z, uh, they are. So, I still have this non-parametric baseline function, this mu zero. And uh, for this time, my risk function, it doesn't only depend on Z. It depends on Z and on T. So the idea is, for example, like maybe it's not that bad to have, uh, for example, a high blood pressure when you're 80, but it's much, much, much more worse to have that bad blood pressure when you're 20. It's like when your covariates are actually, actually have a relation with uh, the duration t, and you want to take this duration into account. So similarly, this function g, it's a very uh, general function, and it's going to be our model that we're, uh, that we're going to try to fit. So it's an extension of deep surf, basically, and uh, actually the loss function is more general, and it's also applicable to uh, deep surf. So the loss function here, I'm not going too much into detail because it's a bit heavy to look at. But you can see we still have the same structure. It didn't change much. We still have this uh, product for all uncensored individuals here. Since it's a log, it's, uh, it's just a sum. And uh, you have another penalization term. 
Uh, similarly, as presently, it's uh, this uh, lambda and the sum of the, uh, so this one, this time it's the L1 norm. It's just another regularization term. And we have, uh, so, so it's, a, it's the same structure that you could recognize. That's the same general underlying idea. So uh, now I'm going to present you a concrete uh, implementation. Uh, sorry, it's here. So uh, if you want to implement, uh, if you want to implement it uh, in practice, so there are two packages that are very useful. Uh, the first one is Lifelines. It's a very very nice package. Can you, uh, can because, you zoom? Yeah. Excuse, sorry. Uh, could you please zoom in? Ah yeah yeah sorry. Okay. So um, two packages that are very useful uh, are lifelines. I like it uh, mostly for the data sets because uh, it has a lot of different data sets that are very fun to play with and to test some things on. Uh, it also has a lot of implemented models, but they are quite basic. So I'm going to use it uh, to get a data set. And the other package that can be very useful in survival analysis is PyCox. It's actually packaged by the author, by the authors, sorry, of Cox time. So it's just uh, implementation of a lot of deep learning models uh, in, in PyTorch. So the data set that I'm going to use here, it's quite fun. It's called uh, democracy data set. Uh, democracy dictatorship data set. And here, uh, so your individuals are uh, head of states and uh, the lifetime is the duration that they spend at the head of state of their respective country. So what is the event dying here? The event dying is living power. And uh, what is censorship? The censorship is when you can't observe uh, the leader to leave power. For example, uh, he, uh, for example, he's dead. Uh, I, I don't think there are other cases, actually. So, uh, for example, here, uh, you have all these uh, countries and different head of states with the years they started and the durations, how much, how many, how many years in power they spent. Yes, so the data set is left truncated in 1946 and uh, it's right truncated in 2008. And if you take, for example, yeah, in Tanzania, uh, so, JKIA Kikwete, so it was an undemocracy. It was a military dictatorship, so he went into power in 2005. He's been there for four years, and he's not observed. Why? Because uh, the data set uh, stopped in 2008. So, actually, he was still in power when we stopped, uh, when we stopped recording data. So, we have 1,800 observations. It's not much, but it, this is mainly a toy example. So it's going to be enough. So the first step could be to try to get an idea of uh, what your data set is like. So uh, here I have plotted the distribution for different uh, geographical areas of the data I have. So uh, it basically, it's the duration observed for all leaders since 1946 of all countries in the geographical area. So it's not, I, I find it's not very clear here. So I've plotted it in log scale. And it's it's much quick. It's much uh, I think clearer. For example, you can very clearly see that for Northern America, uh, the average uh, duration in power is much higher than Northern Europe, for example. So that that's quite interesting to see. And what's more interesting is if you do the same thing for uh, the type of regime. So you have civilian dictatorship, military dictatorship, mixed democracy, monarchy. Uh, parliamentary democracy or presidential democracy, you can see that the average duration of power is much longer for uh, authoritarian regimes than for democracies. It's even clearer in log scale. You can see that the three authoritarian regimes have average durations that are much higher than the three uh, democracy regimes. So uh, they are, so I, I wanted to illustrate the bias in the data set that is induced by the truncation. For example, if you take Franco in Spain, so he actually came to power in 1938 and he actually was in power for 37 years until, until 1975. But in the data set, if you look at it, 
uh, they say he started in 1946 and was in power for 29 years because it's left truncated in 1946. So you have to be careful about it, uh, especially since it's not mentioned. You have no indicator here that your data is truncated. Uh, so if you take a look at the maximum duration that was observed, so we have two ex uh, Fidel Castro in Cuba, which was, who was observed to leave power because I think he handed power to his brother. And you have uh, Hussein bin Talal in Jordan. They both ruled for 47 years and he was not observed because he died, I think. And for the right truncation phenomenon, uh, you can see, for example, if you look for Merkel, who is leaving power only this year, 2021 uh, for Germany. So she started in 2005 but she was only recorded for four years because data stopped after 2008, so she's not observed. So the first step is to get dummy variables out of this categorical variable, so that is pretty straightforward. I think everybody is familiar with uh, dummy encoding, so you just get as many columns as you have categories, and you just have an indicator for each category. Um, in linear models, sometimes you drop one category because the last one is comprised in the bias, but uh, for neural networks, it's not necessary. So I left them all. And yeah, last analysis, if you just take a look at uh, the scatter plot of your uh, durations in power uh, by start here, you see very clearly here, it's very clear as uh, the right, the right uh, censorship phenomenon because of being truncated in 2008. So the first model I talked about, it was the proportional hazards model, it was DeepSurf. So uh, for this model, uh, first I split my data in train test validation. It's pretty, um, pretty classical. And uh, so I have, in the end, I have a bit more than 1,100 values in my train. I just scale the data. And uh, I, so that is not very interesting. That's just pre-processing really. And the first uh, important step here is to get an idea of what's a good learning rate for your model. So a classical method to get a good learning rate for a model, it's just to plot, uh, it's just to make your learning rate increase from very small value to very big value, to plot the train loss and to see at which point uh, your model stops learning. So here you can see that he stops running like around one, 10 power zero. So, uh, and, and then it explodes because he, he's not able to learn anything anymore. So that gives, that just gives us the optimal learning rate. So he says uh, 0 0.27. So usually I get the 10th power that is just under. So it's 0 0.1. Then I just do straining with early stopping stops quite early, early. You have grain loss that is, I would say it is correct given the size of the data that is very, very small. So let's be happy about it. And if you just take a look at the final partial log likelihood of your data, so it was the loss function that I presented in the slide. You have the value here, so the optimal validation value. And if you want just to plot what is your survival function that is predicted by your model for test data. So test data, they have not be seen, been seen by the model, uh, neither in training nor in VAR. So for example, just I just take here the first five, uh, the first five uh, uh, head of states in the test data. I plot the survival functions here. And you can see that you have these estimations. So just take a look at what actually these countries are. So we can see that what is striking is that the first one, the zero, it has a much higher survival function. So it means that uh, at each point, for example, at 10 years, he estimates that his probability to survive after 10 years is still very high. It's still at nearly a half. Whether, for example, for the yellow one, uh, when you are 10 years, well, your probably, probability of surviving is nearly zero. So he estimates a longer duration for blue, then longer for red, and then the other ones not so big. That's kind of what we see. Like the first observation, it was Lesotho. It was Lea Bua Jonathan, and he actually stayed in power for 20 years. The so red, which was the uh, last but not least one, was five less, so it's the second biggest. So it's coherent, like, and the other ones are quite short. So it's coherent with what you see, so it's rather reassuring. 
then it's it's really the same system when you want to implement it in the non-proportional hazards uh, framework, it's it's really very similar to pre-processing, searching for the best running rate for your model, and then when you have it, training, and then finally, like taking a look at your loss, and finally, uh, looking at your survival function. So we see we have the same ordering, it's blue. Uh, so the first one has a higher survival function than the other one, which is coherent with what we see. So it's rather a, a good news. So thank you very much for listening, and uh, I'm very happy uh, to have. Uh, uh, yeah, um, so I'm very happy to have made this presentation. But first, maybe some perspectives. So you can have a lot of other types of model. For example, you can have models where the objective is just to do ranking. For example, you have individuals you don't care about their survival times. So you just want to order them. You just want to know if this guy is going to die before this guy. So that's the only thing that interests you. So you have a lot of models that are based on ranking objectives, like deep hit, for example. You can have recurrent models when your uh, covariate Z ev uh, evolves in time. For example, you have a person who changes BMI, like she loses weight. So her BMI changes is probably better for her health. So maybe her uh, her survival function is going to be estimated higher. So with updates, you can have recurrent models like RNN and surf. You can have multitask, etc. So here are just the resources that I talked about earlier. And thank you very much. Great. That was an awesome talk, Luis. Thank you. Thank you very much for the talk and the presentation. Uh, so we do have a lot of questions. Uh, let's take some of them. Uh, so let's start from the very beginning. So one, one question was, can this be applied to uh, customer analytics area? Yeah, of course. I, I, I think I mentioned it, but very quickly, it's a churn rate. So it, it, it's actually used a lot in customer analytics uh, because here uh, your event is having a customer who lives. The lifetime of your customer is uh, the, the time it's going to spend uh, being active on your platform. And yeah, the, the, event, is going to, the event of dying is going to be uh, losing that customer. So yeah, yeah it, it's, it's, very, it's a very classical field of, of application. Great. Uh, another question that we have here is uh, about the probability. It was, I think, in the beginning of your slides. <laughs> Should the probability uh, be always be one at t equal to zero? Uh, well, no, you can die at zero. For example, in human life, uh, the most classic example, you have a stillbirth. So a baby who dies, uh, who dies at birth. So you can always have death at zero. No, it, it doesn't necessarily is one. Like in the example of human life, it is not one in zero. So this question says, uh, can we transform this method to binary classification, such as predicting whether the event will happen in a fixed period and taking into consideration the censoring part? Well, actually, it is it is binary classification for uh, every period that you uh, that you study because your hazard rate is the probability of dying uh, at the time you're in. So it's at the period you're in. For example, I'm 23. My hazard rate at 23 in the discrete case is my probability to die between at age 23 and before it, I reach uh, age 24. So basically, it's a binary classification problem. But if you want to if you want to uh, address it with classic binary classification models, uh, it's not necessarily going to be optimal. So there's a loss function that is used. Uh, that is very, very similar to uh, to this binary classification problem. It's like a censored adapted binary cross entropy loss. So it's just like the, the classical binary cross entropy loss. Instead of taking it for all individuals in your batch, you take it for only the individuals who are uncensored in your batch. So it's 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 a binary cross entropy loss who takes it, that takes into account this um, this censorship. So yeah, it's possible and it exists. Great, and um, so so I, I don't I don't know what EHR database is, but there is a question that says, uh, can the model be applied to EHR database? Do you know what EHR database is? 
Okay, so I guess it means electronic health records because if it's not, I don't know what it is. So if it's electronic health records, it's like um, a database where you have a lot of medical information on people. For example, you have their weight at given dates, their blood pressure at given date, the size of their tumor at given dates. So yes, of course, it's, it's one of the most primary applications. Okay, and uh, this is about Cox time. So Cox time would uh, seem to be the go-to method, given that it's an extension of DeepServe. Are there any, uh, are there times when we would prefer to use DeepServe instead of Cox time? Well, DeepServe is a variant of Cox, so that doesn't really make much sense. There are other models that are not based on Cox. For example, uh, RNN Serve which is an, uh, a recurrent deep learning model for survival analysis. It's not based on any Cox method. It's based on, it's a kind of multitask. It's not really multitask, but the target loss is a combination of two losses. So it's multitask-like uh, model. While you have two losses, the first one is, uh, as I was explaining, a, a modified binary cross entropy loss which takes into a consensus shape. So its target is the hazard rate at each time steps. And the other loss, the other objective, it's a ranking loss. So you are trying for all the individuals in your batch to order them uh, properly. So uh, yeah, so th this one, for example, is, is not a, a, a Cox variant. OK. Uh, there are a couple of questions about uh, model evaluation. So uh, in terms of, so th there is another question that just says, what about model evaluation? And this, this one is, in terms of evaluation, do you just use concordance or are there any other metrics to use? Uh, it really depends on what is your objective. You can use uh, the concordance index if your objective is to be able to rank your individuals properly. You want to know which one in your batch has the higher risk score, which one is the less at risk. but so that, that, that can be your objective is that is uh, your goal to other people. But if it's not your goal, if your goal is rather to estimate uh, hazard rate, you can use other losses like the modified binary cross entropy loss, like the uh, modified Cox log likelihood. Uh, it, it really depends on what you're trying to optimize. And that's, what, that's why some models actually combine different uh, losses and do some kind of multitask because they want to optimize uh, in different ways. So this is, I think this is an extension to the evaluation question. So for evaluation, C index is the most used metric, but it only gives you the discrimination of the model and doesn't provide an overview of how the model will perform. Uh, how will the model perform, I think, in prediction? Exactly. So, so first, uh, you can't optimize on the C index because it's a counting metric. It's a country me counting metric. So by definition, it has no gradient. So most of the time what you do is that you optimize an upper bound on the C index uh, that you choose with nice sigmoids uh, so that it's nicely differentiable and everything. And so you optimize this uh, upper bound because it mechanically makes your C index goes down. But uh, yes, so the C index, it's, uh, it's a ranking metric. So it doesn't give you any information on the actual hazard rate. For example, a, mod a perfect model it's, for example, if I die at uh, 50 and uh, there's somebody else like Abhishek, he dies at 51. So a good model is a model that is going to order us properly. So it's a model that is going to say that I will die before Abhishek. But if this model says that I will die at 100 and Abhishek at 120, then it's a perfect model with respect of the C index because it's just a ranking metric and the ranking is correct. So this is a perfect model, but it's really not good uh, when you look at the hazard rate. Whereas a model that, for example, predicts that I will die at 51 and Abhishek at 50, it's much, much, much more accurate when you look at the hazard rate because it's much closer to a prediction, but we are not ordered uh, properly. So uh, it's going to be very, very bad with respect to the C index. That's why you always, like not always, but you often have a combination of these two metrics of the C index with another metric. I love the example. <laughs> <laughs> the, the questions keep coming in. Uh, one, one of the questions is about uh, this, how this approach performs uh, compared to the other approaches. 
Uh, well, there are a ton of models, so I didn't try them all. And it really depends on what data you have available. So this one performs well. We have seen that there's not much of a difference uh, in this precise example between the deep serve and between the Cox time, because uh, like the Cox time is just a generalization of the deep serve, basically. But there are models that perform, yeah, very differently. It really depends on, on well, it, this question doesn't really have a yes or no answer. It's, it depends on the data. It depends on what you're trying to predict. So it's really depending on your problem. It's like any other machine learning problem. Yeah. <laughs> OK, um, let's take a few more questions. So um, I just missed this. So, this question is, if, if my main goal is prediction and not estimating the survival probability, which model would you recommend? Uh, I'm not sure I understand the question. So I, I, I guess if, uh, if the person who has the question is still there, uh, they can probably elaborate a bit and we come back to this one. Um, so. Another question from the same person is about, uh, again, uh, so, sorry, this we have already asked. So uh, is there any tricks that you use other than thresholding to get the exact time when your item die? Because we have only probabilities given each time. Uh, ah, so if, so if your goal is to get the time when a person dies, so it's not exactly the same as estimating hazard rate. Hazard rate is the probability of dying at each period for all the possible periods. If your objective is just trying to estimate when the person will die, when then it's just an expectancy actually, because like the hazard rate, it gives you uh, the survival probability, which gives you uh, the distribution. And so you just take the expectancy of this distribution. So it's the, it's the so that's the only difference. Sounds good. So just a couple of more questions. This this one is uh, the usual one. Uh, it comes in all the time. So uh, do we get the presentation and the notebook that you shared? Do, do you, uh, can you share it after? Yes, after of course. Okay, great. I'm going to Thank share you. it on, on LinkedIn so you can find it. I'm, I'm going to share right after the presentation. OK, so yeah. So then I will I will just attach all, all the links to the presentation, to the notebook, and your LinkedIn profile in case people want to get in touch. OK, great. And uh, the last question, where should a beginner in survival analysis start? And what, what would you suggest? What kind of resources? So a beginner for survival analysis? So um, well, first, really understand uh, the idea of uh, censorship and truncation, because it seems very natural at first, but actually very like grasping all the implications, it takes more time. So I would say starting with uh, lower level uh, methods, like uh, I didn't talk about it, but some very common estimators, Kaplan-Meier estimators, Nelson-Allen estimators, it's essential to, to understand how they work. And also I, I think it, it, it all starts with the Cox proportional hazards model, like really understanding the model um, which is not as simple as it can seem. Uh, since it's the base of, of a lot of deep learning uh, models, it's important to, to grasp it. Sounds good. So th thank you very much, Lewis, uh, for, for, uh, for the presentation, for the great talk. Uh, it was quite heavy, Max. And uh, the recording is going to be available later on for you to see again or to revise. So th thanks a lot once again, and thank you for taking the time out. And thanks to all the viewers for joining today. And uh, hope you have a great weekend. Thanks a lot for having me. It was very nice. Thank you.